Puss in Boots by Christian Perrault Once there was a miller who, when he died, had nothing to leave his children but his mill, his donkey, and his cat. The property was soon divided, without involving a lawyer or a judge, since their fees would have taken the whole meager inheritance. The eldest son had the mill, the second son had the donkey, and the youngest had only the cat. The third son was not happy with such a small inheritance. My brothers can earn an honest living by working together, he said. But as for me, once I have eaten the cat and made myself a scarf out of his skin, what shall I do? The cat overheard his speech and drew himself up in a significant manner. Don't you worry, my master. You only need to give me a drawstring bag and have a pair of boots made for me so that I can go through thick undergrowth and you will see that you are not half as badly off as you thought. Although the cat's master did not have much confidence in this promise, he decided he would try anything to escape being poor. And after all, he had seen his cat perform cunning tricks in order to catch rats and mice. When the cat was given what he had asked for, he put on the boots. Then he put some grain and lettuce in the bag slung the bag over his shoulder and set off for a den where he knew there was a large number of rabbits. There, he stretched out on the ground as if he were dead and then waited for some young innocent rabbit to go into his bag to eat his bait. He had no sooner lain down when his plan worked. A young rabbit was tempted into the bag where the clever cat trapped in by immediately pulling the drawstrings. Very proud of his catch, he went to the palace to seek an audience with the king. He was taken to his majesty's room where he bowed deeply and said, Majesty, here is a wild rabbit I am commanded to present to you in the name of the Marquis de Carabas. This was the name he had made up for his master. Tell your master that I am very pleased and I thank him, replied the king. A few days later, the cat hid in a wheat field and set his trap again. When two partridges wandered into the bag, he pulled the strings and caught them both. Then he went to the king, as he had done with the wild rabbit. The king accepted the two partridges with great pleasure and gave the cat something to drink. The cat continued in this way for two or three months, visiting the king from time to time to take his game supposedly from his master's hunting. One day, when he heard that the king was going for a drive along the river bank with his daughter, the most beautiful princess in the world, the cat said to his master, If you would follow my advice, your fortune is made. You only have to bathe in the river at the place I will show you and then let me do the rest. The young man did what his cat advised him, although he wondered what good it would do him. While he was bathing, the king passed by and the cat started to shout at the top of his voice, Help! Help! My master! The Marquis de Carabas is drowning here! When the king heard this cry, he put his head out of the carriage window and recognized the cat who had brought him game so many times. He ordered his guards to rescue the Marquis. While the poor young man was being pulled out of the river, the cat approached the carriage and told the king that some wicked thieves had stolen his master's clothes. The cat had in fact hidden them under a big stone. The king immediately ordered his master of the wardrobe to pick out one of his most beautiful suits for the Marquis de Carabas. The king paid the young man a lot of attention, and the beautiful clothes that were given to him emphasized his handsome face and figure. The king's daughter admired him a great deal. Indeed, it wasn't long before she was completely in love with him. The king invited the Marquis to get into the carriage to join them for the rest of the trip. 
The cat was delighted to see that his plan had started to work, but there was still a great deal to do. He ran on ahead and soon came across some farmers cutting hay in the meadow. Listen, farmers, he said, if you do not tell the king that the field you're working in belongs to the Marquis de Carabas, you will all be chopped up as fine as meat for hamburgers. Sure enough, when the king arrived, he asked the farmers whose field they were working on. It belongs to the Marquis de Carabas, they all replied. You have a considerable inheritance there, said the king to the Marquis de Carabas. As you see, Majesty, it is a meadow which provides for an abundant crop every single year, answered the young man, although he had been truly astonished by their own words. The ingenious cat, still walking ahead, next encountered some harvesters and told them, Listen, harvesters, if you do not say that all this wheat belongs to the Marquis de Carabas, you will be all ground up as fine as meat for hamburgers. The king, who passed a moment later, asked to whom all the wheat belonged. It belongs to the Marquis de Carabas, answered the harvesters, and the king was even more delighted with the young man. The cat, who walked well ahead of the carriage, kept on saying the same thing to everyone he encountered, and the king was astonished to see immense wealth of the Marquis de Carabas. Finally, the artful cat arrived at a beautiful castle belonging to an auger. Indeed, all the land the king had been driving through was part of the estate of this castle. The cat knew this and asked to speak to the auger. The auger received him as courteously as an auger can and asked him to sit down. I had been informed, said the cat, that you possess the gift of being able to change yourself into all sorts of animals that you could transform yourself, for example, into a lion or an elephant. That is true, answered the auger brusquely. And just to show you, I will change into a lion. The cat was so terrified to see a lion before him that he jumped for the nearest rafter to reach the safety of the roof, but the boots he was wearing made it difficult and dangerous. When the ogre had changed back again, he came down and licked his ruffled fur. I have also been informed, continued the cat, that you also have the power to take the form of smaller animals. For example, that you can change yourself into a rat or a mouse. I find this almost impossible to believe. Impossible? Wait and see, exclaimed the ogre. At once, he changed himself into a mouse and started running across the floor. The cat no sooner saw the mouse than he pounced, caught it, and ate it. In the meantime, the king had arrived at the ogre's castle and wanted to call on the owner. Hearing the sound of the carriage rumbling across the drawbridge, the cat ran towards it and said to the king, Your Majesty, welcome to the castle of the Marquis de Carabas. What? Monsieur Le Marquis, cried the king. This castle also belongs to you? I have never seen anything more beautiful than this courtyard and all the buildings around it. Let us see inside, please. The young man gave the princess his hand and followed the king into a large room where a magnificent meal was laid out. The ogre had had this meal prepared for his friends who should have been visiting him that day, but who had not dared to approach the castle knowing the king was there. Both the king and his daughter were quite charmed by the excellent qualities of the Marquis de Carabas. Having also seen all the wealth the Marquis possessed, the king at last said to him, I see no reason why, if you agree, you should not be my son-in-law, Monsieur le Marquis. The Marquis, bowing low, accepted the honor the king did him, and that very day, he married the princess. The clever cat was given the title Great Lord and never again ran after mice except for fun. The end! Thank you for listening! 
Until next time, bye!